Thank you, Elder. Good morning, church. So glad to see you all here again today. And I'm always excited when I get an opportunity to open God's Word. So if I look a little excited or sound a little urgent, it's because the Lord has been calibrating me from week to week, giving me opportunities during the week. I believe that we're living in an urgent time. And if we believe that Jesus is coming soon, there's something that we need to do to be prepared. And one of those is, as the Bible says, sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. Bow your heads as I ask for the Lord to lead and guide in the message this morning. Gracious Father in heaven, what a blessing and responsibility is laid upon my mind and life today. But Father, I know that without your spirit, we are just communicating information. But when the Holy Spirit begins to work in the hearts and lives of the viewers, the listeners, the hearers, the congregants, we know that it can go from head religion to life transformation. Take this message now, Lord, and glorify your name through it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Rome speaks. What could you do if you turned off the lights for 1,260 years? How could you transform the world if you turned all the lights off in the world for 1,260 years? The church that exists in the world today is a church that has metamorphosized, that has changed, that has come out of a time we know in history as the Dark Ages. And for 1,260 years, the Christian church lived in a dark world. But today, God is calling his people. He says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, God's own special people. And what has he called us to do? That you may show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Praise God for the marvelous light. So today, as I open God's word on the topic Rome speaks, I want to make it very clear in the beginning. I am not talking about Roman citizens. I am not talking about people that live in Italy. I'm talking about the fourth beast of Daniel, chapter 7, the fourth nation given to Nebuchadnezzar in his dream. This great kingdom that the Bible predicted would encompass the world both religiously and politically from the days before Christ until Jesus comes again. I'm talking about people who will be transformed and changed, people in every walk of life that are saying today, I need answers. We have been moved by those who have been sending emails saying, my life has been changed, my eyes have been opened, I want to know more about God's truth. When you have a flashlight and you are surrounded by darkness and you turn the light on, people will gravitate toward the light. It is too late for the people of God to be in darkness. And God has given us light not to hold to ourselves, but to be responsible for and to proclaim and to shine that people that are in darkness in every walk of life, the people of God we believe and the Bible teaches, Jesus said, other sheep I have, that are not of this fold, but he said, them also I must bring, and how they will hear my voice. And then he says, and there will be one fold and one shepherd. Jesus is not content to have his people left in places of darkness. And today in our world, religion has metamorphosized in many ways into entertainment, into socializing, into designer religion. People have chosen churches that fit the way they think. But God in these closing hours of earth's history is saying to the people of the world and saying to his church, arise and shine for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, darkness will cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the glory of the Lord shall be risen upon you, 
and shall be seen upon you. If ever there was a time that the people of God need to let their light shine, it is now. What do you say? This is the hour that God is saying to the church, light that flashlight, point it, pierce the darkness, whether it's a candle or a torch, when you light the smallest candle in the darkest forest, the light will be seen. Today I'm praying that God will use my mind and my life and my voice to once again shine the light on a topic that has become so dark. You know, friends, the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14 are the most urgent proclamations to the world. The Lord has given this to John the Revelator to help prepare the world and all of humanity for his soon return. And I believe when we look at the world around us today, we are living in an age of catastrophe on one side, disharmony on the other, rioting, disunity, racial injustice, picketing, looting, on one side, and on the other, disease, famine, loss of life, loss of jobs, numbers rising, numbers falling, people living in abject fear. It is in this hour that God is saying to the church, while the world seems to be a place where there is no hope, God is saying to the church, lift up a standard so that people that think that this world is the last stop can know that there's a better world beyond this one. There's a better day beyond this one. And so this message, Rome Speaks, is going to bring to the stage the urgency of the heart of God. You know, I believe that if the Lord didn't want us to know about the movements in human history, he would not have inspired the prophets like Daniel and John and Isaiah and Jeremiah. He would not have inspired them to write these things. But because he wants us to know he inspired these prophets under the penalty of persecution and death. They have been preserved. Their words have been preserved in God's holy word. And today, more than ever before, the people of God need to say to those walking by, to those they work with, to those that they meet, the hour has come for the light of God to shine. And you know, friends, God already knows everything there is to know about papal Rome. But... He reveals to us this urgent message, and he's going to reveal to us today this earth-devouring system called Papal Rome. What is he going to say to us? He's going to say to us, as has been the urgent cry in the third angel's message, if anyone worships the beast in his image, God has an urgent message warning the world, do not be pulled in by a system that has the appearance of, of religion, but under the hood, there's a different power altogether there. Revelation chapter 13, verse 2 tells us John the Revelator reintroduces this power in the time of the end. Notice in Revelation chapter 13, and look at verse 2 with me. He says, Now the beast which I saw, the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. But then now he picks up the hood. He lifts up the hood in this vehicle and says, but I want you to know what you see, but I want to show you the engine. I want to show you the engine. He says, the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. The dragon. Who is the dragon? The serpent of old called the devil and Satan would you pause for a moment and think about it? The dragon, seeing that God established on earth a church for the enlightenment of humanity, he decided that since I cannot beat them, I'm going to join them. I'm going to wear their garments. I'm going to sing their songs. After all, I was the master musician in heaven. After all, I was the chorus leader in the kingdom of perfection. But when, I've been, when I was evicted, I did not lose my abilities. And so today, we live in a society where, where people have become enamored by the music, but not by God's word. People have been, become converted by the programs, but not by the program of God. And God is saying to us today, Christians and non-Christians alike, the devil has rolled up his sleeve. He is going to punch you with everything he has. He is in it 
to win it. But I'm so glad to know that the Bible says he knows that he has but a short time. Come on, somebody say amen. The devil knows that no matter what he hits God's church with, he knows that he has but a short time. The dragon, according to Scripture, is the power behind papal Rome. And why would he do that? Because Satan wants to accomplish on earth what he could not accomplish in heaven. Notice Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. He empowered Rome to accomplish what he has always desired, and that is to perpetuate an attack against Almighty God. Notice what we read in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. And the Bible says, as God indicts the devil, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. God, I'm going to sit where you alone have the right to sit. I will do it. And then he says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. If I had 6,000 years to make myself look like the most high, I think I could do it. If I had 6,000 years to camouflage my message to make it sound like a message from the Most High, I think I can do it. If I had 6,000 years to dress my movement in the garb of Christianity to make it look and appear to be true, I think I can do it. The devil knows how to do it. He is the master deceiver. Not a deceiver, but the master deceiver. Not a liar, but the father of lies. And for thousands of years, people have been held in darkness, but thank God we no longer live at a time of darkness. If you want to know it, open God's Word, and the Spirit of God will lead you to understand it. If you want to know it, there are books, there's the Internet, there's a library. This is not an age of ignorance. But the devil has kept people in ignorance by giving, giving them religion and feeling rather than the truth of God's Word. But since Satan failed in his attempt... To overthrow God's kingdom, he is seeking to replace God's kingdom on earth. But I praise God that he's given us a guarantee. Look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Jesus has given us a guarantee that the devil will not succeed against God's church. Matthew 16, verse 18 says, as Jesus speaks to Peter, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter. And then he diverts away from Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Somebody say amen. The gates of hell, enfeebled and defective though God's church may appear, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the bulldozer called God's church. This church is not a church built on man, it's built on a rock, and that rock is Christ. This church is not built on human devising and human theological surmisings, it's built on the truth of God's Word. This church is the woman who is not having it. She refuses to accept the invitation to go on a date with the devil. She says, I got a different man. And he wants me to keep his commandments. I got a different man. He wants me to be faithful to his word. I have a different man. I have a new relationship now. I'm not the same woman you met in Genesis. I'm not falling for your lies any longer. And the devil is angry. He's angry with the woman that keeps the commandments of God. God's got a woman. God's got a church that will not fall for the devil's suggestions. But when you read that passage... Just in case you think that the rock referred to here is Peter, let the Bible explain exactly what Jesus meant. Isaiah 44 and verse 8. Let the Bible qualify its own statements. Isaiah 44, look together with me at verse 8. Peter is too frail of a human being for Jesus to build his church on a man that to this point had not even been converted yet. Peter was a man filled with profanity. Why would God build his church on a man whose lips were unclean, whose heart was unconverted. And even after Peter was converted, he was temporal. Why would God build his kingdom on a temporal parable, on a temporal pebble, and not build it on the rock Christ Jesus? The prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 44, verse 8, Do not fear nor be afraid. 
Have I not told you from that time and declare it? He says, you are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Jesus is the only rock. Come on, somebody say amen. He's the only rock that can secure the church. When the children of Israel were traveling through the wilderness, the Bible said that they struck the rock, and the rock out of which the water came, the living water. Today, the rock out of which the living water of God's Word continues to flow, that rock is Christ. There is no other secure foundation other than the foundation that Jesus has built His church on, and that is His own character, His own Word, and His own righteousness. Because today, Peter's dead, but Jesus is still alive. Peter has long since turned to dust, but Jesus has built his church on a rock, and that rock is a rock that will not roll. Come on, somebody. But out of the beast of Daniel 7, out of all the beasts in Daniel 7, when you study the four beasts of Daniel 7, you find this, that the only one that uses its mouth is the fourth beast. The only one that has something to say is the fourth beast of Daniel. Look at Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. And we're going to deal with four areas today that describes what Rome speaks about. We are just beginning because on next Sabbath, it's going to expand even more. We're going to also talk about where the secret rapture came from. Where did that belief come from? Why is it today that Christians believe that somehow while driving their cars or flying in the plane, they're going to suggest, they're going to immediately disappear and, and, and go into nothingness but end up in heaven? Where did that come from? We're going to talk about eternally burning hell. Is that in the Bible? Will God be content to burn sinners forever? Where did that come from? Every lie that came out of the dark, dark ages we are going to unfold it by the authority of God's Word. But the Bible says in Daniel 7 that the only beast that had something to say is the beast of Rome. Listen, in verse 8, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. If you can give another phrase there, pompous means talking loud and not saying really anything. But thinking, pompous words, this boastful system speaking up above all the other systems before it, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, then Rome comes to the forefront and speaks pompous words. But John the Revelator amplifies our understanding of this fourth beast as he reintroduces the power of papal Rome in Revelation chapter 13. And when we read it, we're going to find out what he meant by pompous words. What did John mean? What did Daniel mean? Look at Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. He makes it even clearer. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. That's 1,260 years. That is the power of Rome during the Dark Ages. But what did he do? What did he do with his mouth? The Bible makes it clear. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. If you were to make this comment today, the devil stood on the terra firma and began to hold his fist in the direction of heaven through the system of Rome, began to shake his fist and say, God, you kick me out, but I'm going to use my mouth to try to tear your kingdom down. So God says, go ahead and say what you have to say. And for more than a thousand years, Satan has been polluting the world with blasphemous phrases against God's name, his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. And when the Bible says those who dwell in heaven, it's not talking about people dying and going to heaven. It is talking about the unfallen worlds, the worlds that did not accept Satan's lies, those that dwell in heaven. But when you put it together, when you put the picture of John and Daniel together, you begin to see that Rome 
is a power that is blasphemous. We'll find out what that means in a moment. Daniel says the little horn of, war of Rome will speak pompous words. A little tiny horn with a big mouth. John says Rome will speak great things and blasphemies. We'll find out what those great things, you know what, friends? What's great in the eyes of man is small in the eyes of God. When men are punching, you don't want to be punched by God. I remember the story of Job. Job was mouthing off in his discontent about his condition, and then God took over in Job chapter 42, and he began, not Job chapter 42, in one of the books of Job, I can't remember exactly what passage, but I think around 38, Job was now confronted by God, and God said, you're a man, now let me speak. And God opened his mouth to begin to speak to Job, and Job said, enough. And God said, no, I'm not done yet. And God began to let Job see there's a difference between what comes out of your mouth and what comes out of the mouth of God. But God gave Rome the opportunity. Why would God do that? Here's the reason why. Some might say, why would God allow such a thing to happen in the earth? Why would God allow this system to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven? Why would God allow this system to blaspheme against God? Here's the reason why. There are many people that would have said, if God wiped out the devil in the beginning, everybody would have served God out of fear because God took him out. But God is allowing sin to run his course. God is allowing the devil to be completely unmasked, his system to be unmasked, so that when the time comes for the beast and the dragon, and the false prophets to be destroyed in the fires of hell. When that time comes, nobody will be able to say that God was unjust and his indictment was a rush to judgment. God is saying, I'm giving Rome time. Listen to what he's saying so that you'll remember this when the time of judgment comes. John says Rome will speak great things and blasphemies against God, his name, and his tabernacle. Well, what is blasphemy? Let me define that for you. The Bible describes blasphemy in two ways. One, blasphemy is to claim prerogatives that belong only to God. It is to claim prerogatives and positions and authority that belongs only to God. When you try to put yourself in the place of God and do what God alone has the right to do and say what God alone has the right to say and try your best to be like the Most High, that is an attempt of blasphemy. And the first prerogative that God has, the first thing that Lucifer sought to do, that Satan sought to do to override the prerogatives of God is to change God's law. Look at Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. Look at it together. The first thing he tried to do is to change God's law. Daniel 7, verse 25. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what God's Word makes clear to us today. I am so glad that these are not my words. I am so glad these are God's words. Reliable words. He says, speaking of Rome, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. I talked about that in the last message. And shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into His hand for a time and times and half a time. Adding that up, a time, 360 degrees, times 720, a half a time, 180. When you add that up, you get 1,000 260, the same as 42 months. The Lord is saying during the dark ages, the saints were under the persecuting and controlling hand of the power here described. But changing God's law, and I'll deal with that in more detail next Sabbath when we talk about the change of the Sabbath. But changing God's law and changing times, it was not just the fourth commandment that was altered and abrogated and diluted. But there was another commandment that was changed. One was deleted altogether. The one that forbids image worship was deleted altogether. The one that forbade bowing before carved images 
was deleted altogether. And the third commandment was now moved up in place of that one, and now it's called the second commandment. Listen to this quotation as I share with you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, page 1081, section 2146. Listen to this declaration. I have it on the screen for those of you that are here. The second commandment forbids the abuse of God's name. No, the third commandment. In, in God's word, it was the third commandment. Every improper use of the names of God, Jesus Christ, but also of the Virgin Mary and all the saints. Now, I don't know if you caught that. You may have twitched. But if you caught that, what is being said by the power of Rome is, yes, we should not use God's name in vain, nor the name of Christ, but we also should not use the saints' names in vain or the Virgin Mary's name in vain. Wait a minute. I never found that in the commandments of God. There is no man's name that you can use in vain because there is no man's name that is holy. But in this system, the Virgin Mary has been exalted to a place of the all-holy one. You'll find that in just a moment. And they're saying the second commandment, when you read the second commandment, you don't find the Virgin Mary anywhere in there. And you don't find the declaration to honor all the names of the saints. But God predicted that Rome would tamper with his Ten Commandments. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 14. There is an authority that belongs to God alone, and only God's name is holy. Only God's name is holy. And by the way, in the COVID-19 parameters, it didn't say that you couldn't say amen, but that's all right. Only God's name is holy. Only the name of the Lord is holy. There is no other name above his name. Demons don't even bow at the name of Peter or James or John or Bartholomew. They only bow and fear at the name of Jesus. There is no name above that name. But the Bible says, think to change times and laws. Here's why. Notice what the wise man Solomon says about the inability to change any of God's laws. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 14. The Bible says, I know that whatever God does, it shall be done for how long? Forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. When God wrote the Ten Commandments, he wrote them on tables of stone. Why? Because stone is immovable. You can't erase stone. I love it. When God wrote the sins of man, he wrote it in dust so he can wipe it away. Amen, somebody. But when God wrote his immutable law, which is a transcript of his character and his righteousness, he wrote it in stone. And then he transcribed it from stone into my mind and into my heart. And today... It cannot be changed. It cannot be abrogated. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken from it. So today, why am I mentioning this? Why would I bring out the reality that according to God's word, Mary is not in the holy Godhead according to the Bible? Why? I've got family members. The majority of my family has been under the worship and the adoration of a power that has been leading men to put man before God and not God before man. The veneration of images. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for sinners now and at the hour of their death. Who can answer my prayer but Jesus alone? Who alone can bring me before the Father but Jesus alone? And we know that God chose this young girl. It's all in the book of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. God chose her to be the vessel through which the blessing of the Christ would come into the world. But by no means at her death was she elevated to this immortal stature as the one now interceding in our behalf. Can I get an amen somewhere? God's people must know that. And there are people today that love the Lord with all their hearts, but they have they have been taught to omit God from the safety of their lives. I read it on Facebook. Praying to saints. I read it on Facebook. Venerating people that are in the grave 
in a pile of dust. And I've said to family members, no, she's not your guardian angel. The holy angels of God are your guardian angels. She cannot answer your prayer. Only God, through Jesus Christ, can answer your prayer. But today, the devil has eclipsed by substitutes. There is no one like God, but he said, I will be like the Most High. So he sets up a system to eclipse that which belongs to God alone. And first of all, the second commandment forbids image worship. Look at Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4. The real second commandment, according to God's word, forbids image worship. Let's look at it and peek at it. Exodus 20 and verse 4. The Bible says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. That's the second commandment. Not, not, not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That's the third commandment. The prerogative of changing God's law is that which Satan suggests is his power. The, th the second thing is, the prerogative, the second one, is the prerogative to usurp authority that belongs to God alone. That belongs to God alone. What does this mean in the sense of blasphemy? Look at John chapter 10 and verse 33. Let's describe the scriptural description of what blasphemy really is. John 10 and verse 33. When Jesus was performing miracles, when Jesus was raising the dead and giving sight to the blind, when Jesus was feeding the multitudes, and the Pharisees saw the working power through the hands of Christ, they were perturbed that he would be so bombastic to work in spite of them. And they came to him wondering, who are you? And listen to, what, listen to what John records. The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. Did you get that? He's saying, wait a minute, you're just a man. I remember the many conversations in Scripture recorded there. When Jesus, was at, when Jesus stood with the woman at the well, she said, our father gave us this well. And Jesus said, I'm, I've been around longer than your father. When the, when the Jews said, Abraham, we are the children of Abraham, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. They kept reading the Scriptures, but they kept missing the Christ. It is impossible to read the Bible and miss Jesus except your eyes are closed. But there is a particular Scripture that has been twisted and bent to make it appear as though God has taken His power and put it completely in the hands of men on earth. Look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19. Matthew chapter 16 they said, Jesus, we're not mad at you because of what you did, but we're upset with you because you claim to be God. You claim to be God. Well, I want to tell you, I'm so glad that he is because only God can save his fallen race. Amen, somebody? Only God can redeem his creation. Matthew 16, verse 19. What did Jesus say? We just read the other verse earlier. What did Jesus say? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Listen to this. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, if you leave that scripture, just like many other passages in the Bible, if you let that hang out there by itself, it makes it appear as though God is saying, you decide it, I'll follow it. You make the decision, I'll follow your lead. That's not what the Scripture is saying. You'll understand as we go through this what God is saying. But just to give you a hint, God is saying, I'm establishing my church on the earth, and I'm giving my church a governing authority. I'm giving my church governing authority. But by no means will you think that your governing authority overrides my authority. God's authority is always above man's authority. But listen to how this is communicated by Rome. Once again, the Catechism, page 744, section 1444. This blew me away, added some more grays 
to my head. Listen to this, and I quote, The word bind and loose mean whatever you exclude, whomever you exclude from your community will be from your communion will be excluded from the communion with God. Whomever you receive anew in your communion, God will welcome back into his. Reconciliation with the church is inseparable from reconciliation with God. Now, I want you to get that. What, in essence, is being said here is if I accept you in my circle, God will follow my lead and accept you in his circle. If I bring you into my communion, God will say, good job, John. Now I can bring them back into my communion. It's, in essence, putting the control. Whatever the church, whoever the church allows back into their fellowship, God is saying, I'll follow your lead and let them back into my fellowship. Who's in charge, God or man? God's in charge. And so many people misunderstand what that means. So many people under, misunderstand that God is not giving man the right to decide who fellowships and who doesn't. But God is establishing, establishing his earthly authority. But let the Bible speak for itself before we clarify this. John 6 and verse 37. Let the scriptures speak for itself. God has given the church governing authority, and I'll give you the clarity in just a moment. But let the Bible speak. I'm so glad when confusion exists that God's word can still speak. Can you say amen? John 6 and verse 37. Notice the words of Jesus, not the words of man. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Let me pause. Not all that you give me, but all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. God's not saying the church decide who come to me. No, the Father decides. And when the Father decides, we're on the same page. But the church is not the one that tells me what to do. I built the church on my rock. The church should not, the church should not build itself on its rock. I'm the rock, not mankind. And Peter's not a rock. When you look at the word Peter in the Greek, it means pebble. Pebble. But the word Christ is unmovable rock. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that unmovable rock. They drank from that rock, and that rock was Christ. Jesus is the only unmovable rock. I don't decide who is worthy to come to Jesus. He decides who is worthy. But let's go to Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. Look at it again. No one can decide who has access to God. The church cannot do that. Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, a very familiar passage. And the scriptures are clear. He says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Notice, let's not run past this. Come unto me. Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Why? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Nowhere in those verses did I find, he says, come unto the church and then you can come to me. There are people around the world that are coming to Jesus that don't have a church. There are people serving the Lord in the understanding of their ignorance. But God accepts them as they are because they are coming to him in the name of Jesus. The yoke is not the yoke that the church puts on us. The yoke is the yoke that Christ puts on us. The one that gives us rest is not the church but Christ. But God has given the church governing authority. And you'll see in just a moment, I'll make it very clear. But no human being can decide who has, has access to God. Look at John chapter 10. Praise God, the Bible speaks. When Rome speaks, the Bible speaks even louder. Rome, John chapter 10 and verse 1, listen to what Jesus says outside of the walls of Rome. He says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? 
Uh, if you're trying to come to me through any other avenue other than Christ, that is a thief and that is a robber. There's no other way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. There is no other door that opens up. And by the way, he says in Revelation, I've set before you an open door that no man can shut. When God opens that door, nobody can close it. And I thank the Lord today that the door of Jesus is still open. I don't have to go through man. I can go through Jesus. John 10, verse 7 to 9. Listen to the scriptures again. He makes it clear. The Lord Jesus wanted it to be clear that when he left the earth, you have earthly governing authority in matters just as Jethro told Moses in the Old Testament. He says, Moses, the work is too great for you to handle by yourself. So set up groups of 10 and groups of 50 and groups of 100 and deal with matters in the congregation of Israel and decide whether a person is really repentant or not repentant. If they have repented, bring them back into the tribe. But if their repentance is surface, if they have odds against the movement and refuse to come into compliance with the parameters that God has set up amongst his people, they are not to be allowed back in. But that is not exclusion from heaven. You see, the church has the authority. When there are controversies in the church, the church has been given a governing authority. We have a church board. We have executive committee. If something takes place in the church and the church has to address it, and we've had to do this throughout the years, we can decide if the, if the sinner comes, if the person that has created this infraction comes and brings his or her case before the board and says, here's the situation. If they display a heart of repentance and reconciliation, they are to be embraced and brought back in the spirit of reconciliation into the fold. Into the fold. But if they say, I don't care what the church says, I'm going to do my own thing, God is saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't put the church at risk. Mark those that cause division among you and avoid them. But let me make it very clear. But God is not saying that you can prevent them from attending church. Did you hear what I just said? There is nobody on this planet that I could say you cannot come through the doors into this building. There's nobody that I can say does not have the right to fellowship here. That's why as a pastor, I've always followed the standard. No standards for fellowship. Come as you are. God will change you in his own way and in his own time. Come as you are. Come unto me, all you who are weary and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come as you are. No standards for fellowship. But there are standards for membership. And there are high standards for leadership. And that's the authority God gave to his church. Jesus made it clear in Matthew 28, 18. You know the text. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All the authority belongs to who, my friends? To Jesus, nobody else. The church has limited authority, but all authority belongs to Christ alone. The third prerogative that belongs to God alone he alone is the mediator. He alone is the mediator. But listen to what Rome says. Listen to what Rome says. And I'm reading once again. Catechism, page 1325, section 2677. Listen to what Rome says. And I'm quoting. And I've stood in the congregation with my family there in the Virgin Islands. I've stood there as they prayed and went through the beads. And I thought to myself, Lord Jesus, I don't hear your name but once every ten beads. Ten beads are Mary, and one is yours. Ten beads are Mary, and one is yours. Somebody, somebody, somebody somewhere need to say the name of Jesus rather than the name of Mary. Who can they speak to? And I've seen them climb the steps there in, in, my, in, in, the, in the church in my family's town. And as they got to the top of the steps, they bowed before this, this plaster statue of Mary and venerated and did the sign of the cross and and I said, Lord Jesus, why are they not bowing before you? But here's what Rome says. And this system, I repeat, has been ordained to take Jesus out of the equation. The devil said, I will do it. I will be like the Most High. Listen to what they say. Pray for sinners now and at the hour of our death. And now they explain it. By asking Mary to pray for us, we acknowledge ourselves to be poor sinners by asking Mary to pray for us. I hope you caught that. 
By asking Mary to pray for us, we acknowledge ourselves to be poor sinners and we address ourselves to the Mother of Mercy, the All-Holy One. We give ourselves over to her now in the today of our lives, and our trust broadens further, already at the present moment, to surrender the hour, to, to, to surrender the hour of our death wholly to her care, not the care of Jesus. And they continue, may she be there as she was at her son's death on the cross. May she welcome us as our mother at the hour of our passing to lead us to her son, Jesus, in paradise. What can be more blasphemous than that? First of all, we go to the grave waiting for Jesus to call us forth. Secondly, no mortal person can stand between me and God. When I wake up in the morning, if Jesus doesn't lead me and follow me and keep me through the day, there's no mortal person alive or who has ever been alive that can preserve my life. And I want to let you know, the iceberg is huge. We're just scratching the tip. Let me go on further. Let me go on further. In the same writing, Catechism of Catholic Church, page 1325, section 2679, I'm praying that these individuals will understand it is not Mary that died on the cross for you, it's Jesus. It's not Mary that rose again, it's Jesus. It's not Mary that's coming back to us, you into God's presence, it's Jesus Christ. But they say Mary is the perfect orans, that means prayers, a figure of the church. When we pray to her, we are adhering with her to the plan of the Father, who sends his Son to save all men. Like the disciples, like the beloved disciple, we welcome Jesus' mother into our homes. I welcome the Holy Spirit into my life. For she has become the mother of all the living. We can pray with and to her. The prayer of the church, and this is what got me, the prayer of the church is sustained by the prayer of Mary and united with it in hope. My prayer life is sustained by the power of Christ. When I pray, I pray in Jesus' name. When he taught his disciples to pray, you don't see Mary anywhere in there. He said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. He never mentioned Mary once. But Satan said, I will be like the Most High. I am so glad today to say unequivocally, friends, and with great respect, Mary is not our mediator in prayer or in life, or in death, Jesus is. Hebrews 7.25, let the Bible speak for itself. Don't put words in God's mouth. Therefore, the Bible says, He is also able, not she, He is also able to save to the uttermost. Those who come to God through Him, seeing He always lives to make intercession for them. Today, as I preach, Jesus is interceding in my behalf and yours. Today, as I speak, Jesus is getting our mansions ready. And I don't have to go to heaven and say, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Mary, and Jesus. But the devil said, I will be like the Most High. So let me insert somebody between man and Christ. Lord, have mercy. Jesus is between us and the Father. John 14, verse 6. Jesus is between us and the Father, not a deceased woman. She was chosen to be the birth mother of Christ, not an immortal mediator in heaven. The Bible says it clearly, and these are the words of Christ. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except how? Through me. Jesus is the only one that can give us access to the Father. Jesus is the only one that rose from the grave. Jesus is the only one that ever lives to make intercession. But the devil said, I will be like the Most High. 
And make no mistake about it, he took 6,000 years to get people to believe that. And during the dark ages, he turned the light off. What can I do if I turned your lights off for 1,260 years, Bob? and turned it back on 1,260 years later, you would say, well, it looks like the furniture was always where it is now. And confiscated the Bible, changed them to the altars and the cathedrals in Rome and parts of Europe, and left the people in abject darkness. But I want to say today, because of this darkness imposed on humanity by the church, God understands that these are his people. Somebody ought to say amen. God understands that's why the call in Revelation is come out of her, my people. And there are many of you today watching this broadcast who were once in darkness but heard God called you out and they have taken a stand for this marvelous light. There are people in the movement of God today, commandment keepers that once believed this, but now they believe a thus saith the Lord. Praise God for an undiluted three angels' messages, one that counteracts the counterfeit. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 15 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. And who is it? The man Christ Jesus. Praise God. There's only one mediator and he's alive today. But the last one, the last one, and this is powerful. There's only one prerogative, another one, another one, that Satan seeks to steal from God and that is the power to forgive sin. The power to forgive sin. You see, blasphemy is not only taking the place of God, trying to substitute his authority, but also trying to take away the power to forgive, which only God possesses. Let's look at Mark chapter 2, verse 5 to 7, and see where this comes from. Another indictment that the Jews tried to bring against Jesus. Mark chapter 2, verse 5 to 7. They tried their best to trap Jesus, but you can't trap Jesus. Mark 2, verse 5 to 7. And the Bible says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And the spies were watching. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this. And they said, who can forgive sin but God alone? For those of you that deny the divinity of Jesus, read that passage. You know why he forgave sin? Because he is God. You know why he can forgive sin? Because he is God. He did not, he did not steal God's prerogative. He is God. Pray the prayer. Emmanuel, God with us. He is God. The Son of God came he came, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He did what He only has the authority to do. But let me show you the Scripture that Rome uses. There are many Scriptures used in apostate Protestantism. And brethren, you better put on a fireproof outfit when you come to hear about the, mark, the mouth of the false prophets. Because today in the evangelical community, there is so much deception, you couldn't even pack it in a fleet of 2,000 trailer trucks. And there are sincere Christians falling for it. This emotional inoculation that has robbed people of truth because today we live in a world where if you feel righteous, then you must believe you are righteous. But God wants his people, as my good friend Pastor Brooks, who's now resting in Christ, said, it is not how high you jump, but it's how straight you walk when you hit the ground. God's word is clear. But the papacy has used this scripture to somehow twist it to fulfill their own agenda. John chapter 20, verses 21 to 23. So Jesus said to them, speaking to his apostles, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Spirit. And by the way, for those that believe the Holy Spirit was just given on the day of Pentecost, this is evidence that it was given before the day of Pentecost. But the power was turned up on the day of Pentecost when he gave them the ability to speak in other languages. But he gave them the Spirit of God before the day of Pentecost. And look at verse 23. And this is what people twist. This is what has been mangled to fit an earthly agenda. He said, if you forgive the sins of any... They are forgiven them. 
If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Standing by itself, you might think, wait a minute. I've got the power to forgive, and I've got the power to retain. What does that mean? Let's read first again another quote, and I'll break it down for you. The Catechism, page 770, section 1493. Listen to this. One who desire or desires to obtain reconciliation with God and with the church must confess to a priest. All the unconfessed grave sins he remembers after having carefully examined his conscience. The confession of venial, or that the light-hearted faults, without being unnecessary in itself, without being necessary in itself, is nevertheless strongly recommended by the church. Translated, if you've committed a grievous sin, try to remember what it is and confess it to the priest. But if it's a small sin, you don't have to really necessarily bring it up. But if you do, it's, it's strongly recommended. Let me tell you something, my brother. In the eyes of God, there is no such thing as a necessary sin and an unnecessary, a grave and a light. All sin, all sin can keep us out of the kingdom. Can you say amen? But some tend to think that Jesus was giving the priest power to forgive or not to forgive. No single man has the power to decide that. But now look at verse 23 again and let me explain it. What is being said here by God? And when you study the way that the Lord set up the New Testament, and we're going to walk through a few examples to see how the Lord examined the ch church and how the Lord established the church and what authority he gave. Let me explain very carefully. If a person shows repentance, same thing in the Old Testament, same system set up in Moses' day by Jethro and all of the under leaders among the priests that were there in the 12 tribes of Israel. If a person shows repentance, the leadership does not have the authority to refuse that person forgiveness. But if the transgressor remains at odds with the church, the church has the authority to refuse him membership, but the church cannot refuse anyone fellowship. I cannot say, wait a minute, you're too great a sinner to come to my church. Wait a minute, what have you done lately? Well, don't open a church to that individual because they are really a sinner. Let me tell you how Jesus deals with sinners. There was a thief on the cross. There was a thief on the cross that didn't have a Bible study. He didn't go to a Revelation seminar. He didn't attend a church, but he simply in his heart asked for the Lord to remember him when Jesus came. And Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. When Jesus comes, there is a transgressor called thief who was forgiven at the closing hours of his life, and Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise. But the church does not have the authority. Forgiveness to a wayward member. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18. Let's see how the Bible explains this. There are two types of forgiveness. One, forgiveness to a wayward member. This was the authority to judge in public matters and unsettled private matters, along with the process of reconciliation of an erring member back into the church. Let's see what the Bible says. Jesus was very clear. That's why whenever a person has a problem, we say, follow Matthew 18. Follow Matthew 18. God's word is clear. He says, beginning in verse 15, Moreover, if your brother sins against who? You. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Let me pause. One of the biggest injustices we do to each other is we tell other folk what people have done to us. When the Lord is saying, if somebody has done anything to you, go to that person and tell him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But there's verse 16. And this is the authority that we are talking about. If he, if, he, if he repents, bring him back in. If not, retain him. Listen to what it says. Verse 16, but if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. 
But if he refuses to even hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Now what a sad situation. This is the authority that God gave to the church. If a person has a heart of repentance, the Lord says, reconcile that person. Go to reconcile that person back into fellowship. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Here's the example. Reconcile that person back. Bring them into the fold. This is the process of leading the erring one back, the counsel received to help that repentant one be restored in the church. Paul says it clear to the Galatians in Galatians 6 and verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are together, spiritual, requalification, you got to be spiritual. You cannot be unspiritual and try to help somebody to be spiritual. You've got to be spiritual. If any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one how? In a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. None of us is above temptation. But God was given the church leaders if anybody is overtaken in a trespass, please spiritually restore that person, but do it gently. Do it in a sense of meekness and consider the fact that if the tables were turned, you would want the very same thing for yourself. But God never gave man the authority to determine who can be reconciled to him. That prerogative belongs to God alone. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 and 19 makes it even clearer. To understand forgiveness is so vitally important. To understand the prerogative God gives to the church and the prerogative that God alone possesses is vitally important in dealing with one another. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 and verse 19. Notice how Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, has spoken to the Corinthians. The Bible says, Now all things are of God. How many things? All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through who? Jesus Christ. He's the one that brings me into reconciliation. But what has he done for us? And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's what the Bible is talking about. You can restore such a one. You can help them assimilate back into the fellowship in a spiritual manner, help to reconcile, bring into harmony that person who was once a transgressor. But verse 19 says, that is, that God in Christ, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And I love this part. Not imputing their trespasses to them. And what has he done? And has committed to us, say it together, the word of reconciliation. My brother and my sister, when you deal with somebody, deal with them as though you would want them to deal with you. When you are facing someone who has failed time and time again, deal with that individual the way that you would want God to deal with you. A spirit of humility, a spirit of spirituality, and a spirit of reconciliation. But we are simply ambassadors. We are not determining who can or cannot fellowship with Christ. We are simply ambassadors. Verse 20, the Apostle Paul makes it clear. Now then, we are, say the word together, ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. What is he saying through us? We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Praise the Lord. God never gave that authority to man to forgive sin. But God has given us the spirit and the responsibility of the ministry of reconciliation. And no one individual is involved. Now, the reason I went through all of that, I want to make it very clear. This is not a process in the hand of a single man hiding in a booth somewhere. This is the authority that God has given to the board of elders to the to church board, they get together. That's why the Bible says there is safety in a multitude of counsel. God has never given that power to one man. And when you study history, you find it's a sad reality through this practice of believing that the priest can forgive sins 
they took it to the next level and began to sell indulgences. They were saying, if you're going to sin next week, what, what sin are you planning to commit? Well, here's the cost for that sin. And they paid for that sin. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Go ahead and sin. It's already paid for. That's blasphemous. You cannot pay to sin in advance and pay for forgiveness in advance. Do not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. No man has the power or authority to give you the liberty to sin by paying them to indulge in any kind of sin. But friends, there is an authority God has given to us. Go to James 5 and verse 16. It's called forgiveness one-to-one, -one, or as I call it, forgiveness 101. One-to-one. -one. Never forget it. There is an authority that you individually as a church member has. Here it is. James 5 and verse 16. And the Bible says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be, what's the next word? Healed. And this is where the sincerity of the heart comes into play. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, what are we told? Avails much. When you are sincere, and the person asking for forgiveness is sincere. When two sincere individuals get together and pray for God to intervene, the prayer that they offer will bring about reconciliation. It'll bring about healing. It will be effective through the ministration of God's Holy Spirit. This is where the two that sin was between each other. No one outside of that circle can forgive me for something that I did to Bob. Only Bob can do that. That's what is being said. If Bob has never, if I have never asked Bob to forgive me, what happens? Bob retains that. Bob retains that infraction. When I say, Bob, forgive me for what I've done, Bob said, Pastor, since you're so sincere, I forgive you. I no longer retain your sin. That's what it means. It doesn't mean you can decide who to keep out of the kingdom. Now, there are people that might say, what? what about the person that died and I never asked for forgiveness, my brother, my sister? God will accept that forgiveness today. God will say to you, my brother, my sister, you have tarried long, but I am not an unforgiving God. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen, church. God is not an unforgiving God. But look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Forgiveness is the apex of unity in the Christian church, and God has given no man the authority to have their sins paid for. No man on earth can retain my sins in his bosom and decide whether or not they can forgive or not forgive. We are told in verse 14 and 15 of Matthew 6, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. On that question, how important is it to forgive? No response necessary. In both cases, God is saying to you, you can open the doors of forgiveness when you open your heart to forgive somebody else. You can open God's mercy upon you when you open your heart of mercy upon somebody else. Forgive men their trespasses, and your Father in heaven will forgive you yours. What a powerful thing. What a powerful ministry. God does not want to keep us out of the kingdom. That's why 1 John 1, 9 is there, a passage we are so familiar with. In every case, forgiveness comes only through the merits of Christ. If we confess our sins, you can say it with me, if we confess our sins, what does the Bible say? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what else? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me make it clear. Who is faithful? Say it together. He is. What's his name? Jesus. He is faithful, not a man in a booth, not a man who has a robe, not a, any man, whether robe or without or suit. Nobody can stand in the place that belongs to God alone. 
That's why when Jesus comes, as I close, when Jesus comes, this system, this counterfeit system that has held billions into abject darkness and slavery and penance, paying for their sins, carrying out acts of repentance, carrying out acts of reconciliation, climbing stairs, crawling on their knees, saying prayers on their knees, walking miles. This system that has kept men in bound acts of hoping that they can work themselves into God's favor when the Lord says, simply ask and you'll be forgiven. Simply repent and you'll be forgiven. What a system. But my friends, the judgments of God on Satan's counterfeit will come from the mouth of God. You heard me correctly. Because of Satan's mouth, God is going to have the last say. Whatever Rome has said, God will speak last. The judgments on, of Satan's counterfeit will come from the mouth of God. Why? Because Satan used his mouth to blaspheme God. And if you think that Rome has a lot to say, you wait until God speaks. Look at our last passage. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. What does the Bible say? How fitting that the Apostle Paul uses the phraseology he does. And why does he? Because he understands where Satan's attacks are coming from out of his mouth. He says in verse 7 and 8, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Satan, you have used your mouth to attack my kingdom, I will use my mouth to consume your kingdom. You have used your mouth to wrongly accuse Christ, I will use my mouth to rightly judge you. When God has the last word, I want to be on the right side. What about you, my friends? When God speaks, I want to be there to hear God declare that every decision he has made is just and right and true. That's why, as David the psalmist says, the only proper use of the mouth is here recorded. He says, and I want you to read this together with me, Psalm 71, verse 8. This is the only proper use of the mouth. Let my mouth be filled with your what? Praise. And with your glory all the day. I want my mouth to be filled with God's praise. Anybody else here today? My brother and sister, we want our mouths to be filled with God's praise. Rome has a lot to say. Our next message, we're going to find one of the greatest impacts that has separated the world. How has Rome been instrumental in violating, in abrogating, in diluting in transcribing, in transforming, and in getting rid of the law of God. What has it done? What has this system done that millions of Christians today accept some in ignorance, some seeking to justify it in God's Word? What is happening every Sunday all around the world, people gathering where in God's Word is the authority for the observance of Sunday as a holy day. We'll find out in the next sermon. As Rome speaks continually, we'll find out why God is so upset, why God will one day call his people out before this system is consumed by his judgment. My brother and sister, make it clear, God is not angry with humanity. God is angry with what Satan has done to humanity. God is not angry with people that worship on different days, but God is not content to leave them in darkness. He will bring them to his marvelous light. God is not judging people that don't know better, but God will hold the leaders in high responsibility that have intentionally led people into darkness. But in these closing hours of earth's history, God is saying, wherever my sheep are, they will hear my voice. They will come out. They will know that God has not said what Rome has said it said. But God speaks the truth. God presents the light. God presents grace. 
God alone can forgive. Jesus alone is our mediator. And there is no authority on this planet higher than the authority that Christ has given. And on the rock, Christ Jesus, the church is built, not on a man who is just a pile of dust in the grave named Peter. My brothers and sisters, that's what God's Word says. If you want to follow God's Word, if you want your life to be the place where God's truth can be resonated, why don't you bow your heads with me? If you're here, why don't you stand with me? We're going to stand in God's presence today and ask for the Lord to give us wisdom for thousands, yea, millions of people today are looking in this time of darkness for that marvelous light. People are searching today in a world of entertainment, in a world of emotion, in a world of feeling. And there's nothing wrong with feeling, nothing wrong with emotion, because you can tell I'm, I'm emotional, but my emotion is based on the assurance of God's Word. My feeling is, thank you, Lord, that I feel the blessed assurance that what you have said in your Word can be trusted. If that's where you want to be, my brothers and sisters, you can contact us here, tvsdac.org. If you want more information, send an email. We'll try our best to get to all of them. But God, in these closing hours, has a truth that you must know because Jesus is soon to return. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word, which is a lamp, a lamp that has never been unplugged. Thank you for your word, which is a light. It hasn't been hidden and sequestered under a bushel. Thank you for your truth. Though many hammers have hammered away at its contents, yet the anvil of time, your word, has worn out every hammer of the adversary. Father, we pray today for somebody listening to this broadcast. They might say, Pastor, I am so upset with you. I am so upset with you. You just simply walked all over everything I believed. Oh, my brother and sister, don't be upset. Do something about it. Check it out. Examine it. See whether or not what has been said is true. And then walk out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Abandon the traditions of men, the edicts of humanity, and cling to nothing but thus saith the Lord. Lay aside all human mortal mediators as such, and may Christ be the only mediator between you and God. And may the Spirit fill your life and answer your prayers, not some entity that has no ear to hear, but is still waiting for the coming of the Lord. We pray today by God's Word that you will know and have that blessed assurance that you can trust the written Word of God. So may God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. I've been waiting to hear that for months. Amen. Amen. God bless you, my friend. We look forward to seeing you next Sabbath as we talk about the day.